Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, third chapter of 1 Corinthians, as we're making our way through this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Uh, we've discovered uh, that Paul is dealing with uh, a collection of very immature believers. And because this church is populated with immature believers, it should surprise us not that this church uh, has, a, has a truckload of problems. They've got problems with conduct. They were getting drunk during communion services. They've got problems in their marriages. They've, they're, they're engaging in a, in a very unorderly abuse of the spiritual gifts. I mean, we could go on and on. Man, these guys are just a mess and they are not getting along. And so we've got sharp divisions in this church, and that's really been the, the meta-narrative or, or the bigger picture in the first couple of chapters here. You've got sharp division because of spiritual immaturity. And we've talked about how that, that certainly holds true for, for you and I today, that, that wherever we... Wherever we find, and, and really to the degree that we find division in our lives, at the root of that is going to be a, a corresponding degree of immaturity. Now, Paul has told us that part of the problem with man's wisdom is that men that operate purely on the basis of human wisdom alone flat out do not recognize the wisdom of God. And... and um, Paul illustrated that with Pilate and, and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and the boys where, where they had the Son of God right there in front of them, God incarnate in the flesh right here, and, and they didn't recognize him. And these guys weren't idiots, right? I mean, they were highly trained, highly intelligent men. The very fact that they put to death the Son of God is proof positive that man in and of himself cannot perceive the wisdom of God. And so Paul went on to show that the sharp divisions there in the church at Corinth were ultimately just a, a function of the base pride uh, driving their immaturity. We as human beings, do we not? We, we have, the Bible tells us we have this tendency to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Romans 12. We have this tendency to think that the buck stops with us. We have a tendency to think that we know it all. And yet here we are, absolutely surrounded by the wisdom of God, and yet we don't acknowledge the wisdom of God. You really want to get a hold of that, uh, take a look at the latter part of uh, Romans 1 someday. And, and by the way, if you're ever looking for a wonderful passage of Scripture for personal devotion, might I suggest to you Psalm 139, all right? One of the gems there in Psalm 139, verse 14, you know the verse, David talks about how our bodies are, are fearfully and wonderfully made, that, that in our bodies alone there's just tremendous evidence of the, the stunning creativity uh, and the genius of God. You know, in our lungs... For example, we have 700 million cells, and they are constructed with just incredible sophistication. You've got this tremendous surface area greatly compacted through all these nooks and these crannies that, that if you could somehow remove the lungs and spread them out over a smooth surface, it would cover over 2,000 square feet. And yet it's packaged neatly and placed within within our chest cavities. And we've got this blood running through our veins, 30 million white blood cells, 180 trillion red blood cells, all being circulated by this miraculous pump called the heart that by the time you reach age 70 has already pumped two and a half billion times and has moved over 500,000 tons of blood. And it flows through your kidneys, and your kidneys are taking out the bad stuff and leaving, leaving the good stuff. How does it know? I mean, how do the kidneys know? Well, this is good, leave that in. This is bad, let's get that out of here. Again, it is all the brainchild of Jesus Christ. You remember Colossians 1.16, speaking of Christ. By him, all things were created. So 
Here we are, saying all that to say this, here we are surrounded by the creative genius from, from without and from within, surrounded by the wisdom of God, and we don't even recognize it because we're just full of ourselves and, and we're full of our own importance and, and, and our own wisdom. Now, that is not just a problem with the secular humanists, all right? That same problem can follow us right through the front doors of the church, and indeed that has happened here in the church at Corinth. Now, Paul is going to be giving us some of the very strongest warnings concerning church division that we have in all of the New Testament tonight. And I believe he is going to deeply deeply challenge each and every one of us in this room to get our mind off of the things on the earth and upon the landscape of eternity. And then he's going to tell us very soberly why that needs to be the case. And his hope is that, that when these Corinthian believers get their minds and their hearts around the gravity of what's at stake here, that, that there are eternal consequences to what it is that we do with what God has given us. He's hoping that if they get a hold of that, it's going to dispense with a lot of the garbage that they've got going on here. And listen, we have got to check, again, our, our preconceived ideas at the door here and allow ourselves to be instructed by, by the word of God, particularly when it comes to a material as significant as that which lies before us uh, tonight. Very, very important material here. It is imperative. Here is is always that that we don't look to the scriptures to support our preconceived ideas, but that we allow, rather, our views to be formed by the scriptures themselves. I have got to believe, again, for the saved Christian, this is about as heavy as it gets, pretty heavy stuff, super important, not for the faint at heart here, very critical, and yet there is tremendous spiritual, untold spiritual profit for you if you can wrestle this down to the ground. And, and no doubt a lively discussion will follow the teaching today, and I look forward to that, that discourse. Now, the last time we were together, you remember Paul had used the illustration of a garden, that the church is a garden that Paul you know, watered and uh, Paul planted and Apollos watered and, and so forth, but God caused the increase. This week, the apostle will build his exhortations around the illustration of a builder, a builder. So let's get after it tonight, beginning uh, then in verse 9 of chapter 3. Let's go for it. All right, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, Paul calls himself a master builder, I laid a foundation, underline foundation, and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds, underline that, how he builds upon it, okay? According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. All right. So Paul identifies himself as a master builder. You might have expert uh, builder. You might have wise builder in your translation. This Greek word here is architecton. It's where we get our word architect from. Uh, So Paul is moving from agriculture uh, to construction now in his illustration. Now, um, What Paul would do when he was establishing a church is that he would physically move into the community for a period of time. Sometimes he would be there for a couple of weeks. Sometimes he would be there for a number of years. And he would lay the foundation, which we'll get to in a minute, and then he'd pick up and just move on down the road. And as he was leaving, there would be a group of of people who would gather around that foundation that that Paul had laid, And Paul would say, essentially, all right, be blessed, guys. I've laid the foundation. You now need to start building. See you later, all right? And he would go somewhere else. And for various points of time, Ephesus, three years. Thessalonica, three weeks. Here in Corinth, he happened to be there for a year and a half. And and I would imagine the duration of his stay was a, a direct function of 
what he believed to be the condition um, of that initial flock or, or what he believed to be the condition of the field or the building, as Paul calls the church here in verse 9. But Paul would be in a city or a village, and his work was primarily that of establishing a foundation. And of course, from time to time, he would go back either through a direct visitation or, or writing them letters, and, and thus really the occasion for, for all of Paul's letters that we find in the New Testament. Now, mark this very carefully at the end of verse 10. Okay, Let each man be careful... You might have take heed in your translation how he builds upon this foundation. Let each man be careful how he builds on this uh, foundation. First of all, he says, let each one or every man. He's not addressing a conference of church leaders or, or pastors exclusively here. And yes, they should no doubt pay particular attention to this text. Uh, you know, James says you know, not, a, not everyone should be a pastor or a teacher because they're held to a, a higher a level of accountability, stricter judgment. Don't think that doesn't make me shake in my shorts from time to time. But uh, the Greek here, literally every man or woman, Paul is addressing the entire church here, the entire congregation. And remember that Paul was an apostle called to the Gentiles. All right, Peter, James, John, those guys were were called initially to the Jews. And so Paul is really our apostle in a sense. Peter, James, and John sent to the Jews. Paul was sent to the likes of you and I. So the two questions we should ask ourselves is, is number one, what was the foundation that he laid? Right? And then number two, why is it that he is saying we need to be careful how we build on it? Why is he saying that? So the Lord is saying to you and I, hey, the foundation has been laid. Now I want you to take heed how you build. Well, just what is the answer to number one? What is that foundation? The answer then in verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There it is. The foundation of the church is not church tradition. It's not the teachings of various church leaders throughout the centuries. It's not the findings of various church councils. It's none of those things. It is not a set of principles or practices, but rather it is a person. Okay? There is only one foundation, and it is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, after Paul's stint in Athens... He learned his lesson there. You remember we spoke of that a couple of weeks ago. After that, everywhere that Paul went, he had one message, and it was Jesus Christ and him crucified. He did not try to impress with intelligence or eloquence. He simply brought the gospel. Now, when you came to Jesus Christ, you established this foundation in your heart. All right? Now, again, there are people that think, all right, well, I've gone forward in a church service and I've said the sinner's prayer. I'm saved. Got that deal behind me. That's checked off my list. I'm moving on. Wrong. Coming to Christ is not where it ends. It's where it all begins, you see. You remember the last time we were together, Paul indicted the Corinthians for this very thing. He said that they had not moved beyond the milk of the word to the meat of the word, right? Again, the milk of the word, if you missed last week, is what Christ has already done in your life. And the meat of the word is what he wants to now do in your life today. All right? The milk is what he's already done. The meat of the word is those exhortations that, that God is putting in front of you in order to, to deal with you today. Now, the Corinthians had received the milk. They, they had received the elementary truths of the gospel, but they just didn't want to do anything with it. So Paul's saying, guys, coming to Christ isn't the end. It is the beginning. And that's really what we discover Paul continuing to shape and develop here. Because you don't, you don't finish with a foundation, right? You begin with a foundation, so he's continuing to develop that idea. Jesus Christ is our foundation. He is that which we are to now build upon in our lives. 
Now again, Paul is using fully inclusive language here. He's saying no man, no man can lay any other foundation. He's not using ecclesial references here in the Greek. You know, he's a, this is not something just a pastor or bishop or elder does. This is something that every human being who has come to the foundation of Jesus Christ does. If you have come to the foundation of Jesus Christ, you have built this week. I have built this week. And Paul's exhortation is every person needs to be careful to take heed how they build on this foundation. Now I think most of us understand in here that we are saved by grace alone, right? We're not saved by works or deeds, all right? Insert nod head, okay? All right, well, in, in the vernacular of Paul's illustration here, we're not, in, in the vernacular of this illustration, we're not saved by how we build... All right? And so if we're not saved by how we build, what's the big deal? Why do I need to worry about this? Well, Paul thought it was a pretty big deal. And I want you to appreciate something about this man that I think it's easy for you and I to forget. The things that this man had done were, were absolutely remarkable. In presenting the gospel, Paul had covered this incredibly large geographic area. He told the Romans, everybody in Asia Minor, everybody in Bithynia, uh, they've heard the gospel. Everybody over here in Macedonia and in Greece They've all heard the presentation of the gospel in Achaia. They've heard, and, and so I guess I'm going to go to Spain. It would be like Paul saying, I've presented the gospel in Michigan. Everybody's heard it over there. I've been through Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. Everybody's heard a presentation of the gospel there. So, so I guess I'm going to Wisconsin. Okay? Now, the guy had no car. He had no cell phone, didn't even have a dude, didn't have a moped. All right? Here he is on foot, and he goes through this huge geographical territory. Now, ask yourself the question, what in the world possessed this man? I mean, where does a human being get that kind of energy and that kind of passion to accomplish what this guy had accomplished? And the reason is because he knew, I am building here, and I need to take heed how I build. All right, well, why is it important? Question number two, here's where the rubber really hits the road in our text here. Tune in, pay, uh, pay very close attention. We're going to look at 12 through 15. Now, verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man, there's that fully inclusive term again, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test, notice the, not the quantity, the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive, big underline here, a reward. Underline that word reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will yet be saved, though through fire. All right, well, there's a lot here. Very, very important. Let's get after it. I want you to notice, first of all, the two kinds of material, two categories of material you can build with here in verse 12. Okay? As you're building your spiritual house this week, you are either building with materials that will survive a fiery trial, or you are building with something that, that will be consumed. You're either building something permanent or temporary. So mark this distinction very carefully. Gold, silver, precious stones will survive a fire. Wood, hay, and straw will be consumed. All right? Top of verse 13. Secondly, each man's work will become evident. You might have each man's work will, will become manifest or made clear or, or shown for what it is in your translation. Every human being's work is going to be made 
manifest. Everything that you have done, everything that I have done, will one day be brought to light before God. Now, notice this fiery trial. Paul says revealed by fire here. Notice this fiery trial that is awaiting each and every one of us. Nothing to do with quantity. Paul is saying it has everything to do with quality, not quantity. Okay? In other words, what sort of building did you make? Not how many. What sort of building did you make? What is the quality of the material you built with? Of what sort is it? All right? And that material, whether it is consumed by fire or, 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 or whether it survives, okay, and that is to say whether, it, whether it's temporary or earthly or permanent or eternal, is going to be based upon not what you have done, but why you have done it. Okay? In other words, it's going to be based upon motivation and faithfulness. Now, we discovered very clearly last time we were together, we are not rewarded for results. We're not rewarded for what we believe to be success. We are rewarded for faithfulness. You remember that? Okay. Now, the truth that motivated Paul, this man that accomplished the unspeakable, was the understanding that one day in his life, God and eternity would invade and suddenly be upon him for all time. And the very same thing is true for each and every one of us. The day is coming, either by your death or the second coming of Christ, the day is coming when God and eternity are going to invade your life and, and suddenly be upon you. And at that point, friends, there will be a final exam. And in that final exam, there will be determined what your position what your ranking will be throughout all of eternity, and it is going to be based upon the kind of material that you've been building with. Jesus said it, if you fast, if you pray, if you, if you give money to be simply seen of men, you've got your reward. That's it right there. You've given the church $10,000. Praise God, you're a wonderful human being. And, and to show you our appreciation, we've got a big bronze plaque by the front door. We're going to put your name on it. Now, I hope you enjoy the plaque because that's all you're getting out of the 10 Gs, all right? Jesus said you have your reward. When you operate in such a way that you're acting spiritual in order to get people to notice you, you are building your life on wood, hay, and straw. But when you are living your life and doing your acts of righteousness in such a way that the right hand doesn't know what the left is doing, uh, uh, that, that, that you're doing what you're doing not to be seen by men, not to draw attention to yourself, but you're doing it just out of the, the, the desire to, to please this Lord that you've come to know and adore, well, then you're building your life out of gold and silver and precious metals. And that will endure, and you can take that with you into eternity. All right? Now, listen, before anybody gets a theological nosebleed here, okay, two things I want to make clear. All right, number one, let's be very clear, we are not speaking of heaven or hell. All right? Heaven or hell was the day, heaven or hell was decided the day you started building your life on that foundation. Okay? The day that you accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, that was the day you secured for yourself heaven. Our salvation itself, let's be clear, has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with what Christ has done. As, we've say, as we say here, salvation isn't do, salvation is done. All right, It's not what we do or don't do, it's what Christ has done. The word of God is not here swerving into a works-based theology. Don't miss the point. Salvation is entirely based upon grace. Okay, We're talking about already been saved, having already stood on that foundation, now what? Okay, we'll get to that. Second thing we want to be clear about here is that this judgment Paul is talking about here is for believers. Okay, before we get back to our text, I want to make, make sure that you understand that the Bible teaches there are two judgments, all right? There is a judgment for believers, 
and there's a different judgment for unbelievers. Okay? Just stay with me. First of all, the judgment for believers that is in view here is called the Bema Seat or the Judgment Seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. Bema was a Greek word for rewards bench. Uh, in Paul's day, they had what we might call uh, the Olympic Games of, of, of their day, and, and there was a rewards bench there called the Bema Seat, this Judgment Seat, and it was there that rewards were handed out. And it's important that we understand that, and, and it's also incredibly encouraging. You see, there is no punishment meted out at this believer's judgment. All right? There's no punishment meted out at the believer's judgment. There is only the handing out of rewards. The only thing you can suffer is what Paul says here, loss of reward. All right? Get this down, guys. There is no punishment at the believer's judgment seat because Christ himself has already endured the punishment on our behalf. That's what the cross was for. That's the gospel. And that ought to encourage you. There is no punishment in your future whatsoever because Christ has taken all of that for every sin that you have committed, are committing, and will commit. That's been taken care of as far as salvation is concerned. Nothing to do with what we do or don't do. Everything to do with what Christ has done. Now, this is another Bible study. We won't get into it. But for the unbeliever, uh, there's a different judgment. It is called the great white throne judgment. You can read about that in Revelation 20. And there, unbelievers will face punishment for their sin. They will face judgment because they didn't accept what Christ had done in their stead. So believers will be judged at the judgment seat, the Bema seat, and unbelievers will go to this great white throne judgment. Believers will receive a reward as they've built accordingly, and unbelievers will face punishment for their sin because they refused Christ's judgment on their behalf. Okay? So I want to be clear about that. Two different rewards, uh, two different judgments, believers and unbelievers. Back to the text. Let's be clear on this. Works and deeds do not de uh, works and deeds do not determine where you spend your eternity. Works and deeds do not determine where you spend your eternity, but they do have an impact upon the quality of your eternal experience. Okay, the day you accepted Christ, you became heaven bound. You were saved. You are set upon that foundation of Christ. Had nothing to do with you. It was all the grace of God. But beginning in that day, you started building on that foundation. You started building your spiritual heart. Look, it's what John said. In the book of Revelation, he described Jesus as, as being this God who had eyes, uh, eye, eyes that are a flame of fire. And those flaming, searching eyes are going to examine each and every one of our lives alone to determine what you've done with the emphasis upon why you have done it. And depending upon the kind of material that you have been building with, it is going to determine the landscape of your eternity. What kind of position you're going to experience throughout the eternities that are yet to come. This is why Christ exhorts us to invest in eternity. This is why he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? Now again, maybe, maybe you just believe that Christ is the answer to your sin problem. You've accepted Christ, but that's where you leave it. You know, like the Corinthians here, you just don't do anything with it. Well, in that scenario, Paul is saying here in verse 15, you're going to be saved, no doubt about that, but you're going to come out of that the other side of that fire a little toasty critter, all right? Because everything you've built your life upon will have been consumed. And so the question is, I gave you breath. What did you do with it? I gave you opportunity. What did you do with it? I gave you a certain degree of health. What did you do with it? I gave you resources and gifts. What did you do with them? Listen, we're not all going to be alike in heaven. 
We're not all going to be alike in the resurrection. The Bible does not teach that. Now, people will react to that in the flesh. And they'll say, well, that's not right. I mean, well, won't that cause all the same kind of envy and jealousy and, and all that stuff we're dealing with here? No, it will not. Okay? Listen, you, you will have been purified. There's no sin in heaven. Right? There's no sin. There's no flesh in heaven. You've got a glorified body and mind. There's no devil. He's been put away. Man, you're going to be thrilled for people. You're going to be sharing in their joy. In short, you're going to be doing what God is trying to train you to do right now. We're in training. Right? Right? Look, I can't explain the logistics of it. It's an entirely different game, man. I mean, it's, a, it's an entirely different dimension, so much so that when Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he said, I, I, it would be unlawful for me to even try to describe this or diminish it with earthly words. And by the way, at the end of the day, God is not asking me to explain it. God is not asking you to explain it. He's asking you to believe it. To accept it. Now, a little bit later on in chapter 15, Paul's going to give us one of the best chapters in the New Testament on the resurrection. And he's going to say, speaking of what we're talking about here, Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, some will look like the moon, some will look like the midday sun, and some will look like the stars. Paul is speaking of various degrees of glory. In the resurrection, various degrees of light. In other words, we're not going to be equal in the resurrection. We will not have the same degree of authority. We will be tested. There will be an examination to find how we have built, what we have done with that which God has given us, and that will then set the tone and posture the landscape of what our lives will be like throughout eternity. The where of eternity is answered by faith alone. Do you believe Christ is, is the answer to your sin problem? Boom, there's the where question. Okay? But then the quality of that eternity is based upon how you have built with what God has given you. Jesus gave a number of parables. You remember Luke 19. One guy was super faithful. He had authority over ten cities. One guy was kind of faithful. He was given authority over five cities. One guy wasn't faithful at all. He had absolutely no authority in the kingdom to come. And there's an abundance of scriptures to this effect. We're not going to have the time to go over, but be a good Berean. Go and search the scriptures, friends. Check out uh, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Or, or, Mike, put up that slide, please. If you're really short on time tonight, all right, you can go to one verse in the book of Revelation. Pretty clear there. Jesus says, Jesus speaking says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to each man according to what he has done. Listen, there are degrees of reward in the eternal realm, friends, regardless of your reaction to that in the flesh. Okay? Now, some of you may have picked up on this, Within the categories, right, and you've got two types of categories. You've got gold, silver, precious stone, one, and you've got wood, hay, and straw. Would you notice in each of these categories, all right, you have degrees, do you not? I mean, gold and silver and precious stones will survive the fire. Clearly, they're all not equal in value. Maybe you picked up on that. Another thing maybe you picked up on and I think is pretty cool, is that, you know, the wood, hay, and the straw will get consumed, but the gold and the silver and the precious stones, when they go through that, that fire, are actually refined and made better. I think there's a pretty powerful uh, uh, allegory there. Now, let's bring the real, okay? Let's bring the real here. What are we to do with all of this? Well, Paul is trying to communicate what he is trying to communicate to the Corinthian churches, the glaring question that should be upon each and every one of our hearts. What has God given me, and what should I be doing with that which God has given me? 
Because my faithfulness to the resources that God has given me will determine the kind of, of, of position, the kind of quality that I will have throughout the kingdom to come in eternity. Look, at the end of the day, this Corinthian church has, has got a boatload of problems, a boatload of divisions as a result of those problems. Their hearts are consumed with pride, and Paul's simply saying, look, you guys need to get your eyes off of the temporal, off of the temporary, and you need to see, and, and you need to understand, guys, that eternity is marching in your direction, and one day it is going to invade your life Get ready for eternity. And that's exactly what Paul is telling you and I. Eternity is marching day by day in our direction. And I think, I think that the degree to, to which we have in view the eternal, the degree to that we are thinking of eternity is the degree that we can deal just a crushing blow to so many of the hassles and struggles that we're dealing with. When you and I recognize, dear friends, that, that eternity is marching in our direction, when we spend time in prayer and, and meditate upon the reality of eternity, uh, the fruit of that is just going to be a, a real perspective in life. And we're not going to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And, and, and we're not going to think so highly of some of these problems we think are such a big deal. And of course, the other great benefit to keep in our mind on things above, which by the way, Paul told the church at Colossae, right? Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on, on things above, not on the things of the earth. That's your memory verse in your study guide. The other great benefit here for us is that the reality of eternity uh, marching in our direction ought to cause you and I to have a greater sense of urgency to be about that which the Lord has called each of us to be about, all right? Okay. Now, uh, as it concerns division, very strong warning here uh, for the church in verse 16. Uh, do you not know that you, by the way, that you is plural, not talking about individuals, talking about the church. Uh, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, whoa, here comes the warning, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you, again plural in the Greek, are. So the word you in both verses, plural in the Greek. He's not talking about the individual believer. He is talking about the corporate body of believers. Now, later on in chapter 6, he'll say, don't you know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? There, he's talking about the individual believer. Here, the corporate church. There are, a number of word, uh, there are a number of words for temple in the Greek. This word here for temple means inner sanctuary. If you studied Exodus, that's the holy of holies, right? That's the place where, where God's presence was seen and made known. Paul is saying here in verse 16 that the church is that place where the presence of God dwells. As we gather as a corporate group of people, the presence of God is here. Now... Verse 17 then, pretty harsh, right? I mean, we've just, I mean, I will destroy he who destroys the church. I mean, that, that's, that's some pretty rough language there. What's going on? Well, we've just established that he's talking about the church, and we know the church is called what in the New Testament? The bride of Christ. The church is his bride. It's like this. You want to get a guy's attention? Start messing with his wife, all right? You start messing with a guy's wife, man, you are going to have to answer to that man in like manner. When you start messing with the church, you are messing with God's bride, and God will take note of that. And so the warning is, you mess with the church, God's going to mess with you. Come on. All right? Now, this word for destroy or defile, you might have defile if you got a King Jimmy. This word in the Greek literally means, and I don't know what this means, you make of it what you will, but this word in the Greek means to shrivel or wither or spoil. I don't know exactly what that means for you, all right? But I know I don't want that in my future. That doesn't give me warm, fuzzy feelings. I doubt it does you either. 
The point is, God takes division in the church very seriously. He does not want anybody messing with his bride. And those that do, God will one day sort out. Okay? All right. Well, then he says in verse 18, uh, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Uh, for the wisdom of this world is, is a, a foolishness before God, for it is written, and he's quoting Job 5 here, uh, he is the one who catches the, the wise in their craftiness. And again, now he quotes Psalm 94, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. Now, we, we covered, I think, uh, fairly thoroughly in the first two chapters, this idea of the folly of the wisdom of men. So we're not going to spend time doing that tonight. But again, he's quoting Job 5.13 and Psalm 94.11. And he's just hammering home this idea that men deceive themselves when they profess to be wise. That, That much of our division would be eliminated if we just didn't think we were so smart. Okay? Listen. The greatest barrier that will keep you from receiving truth, the greatest barrier that will keep you from receiving truth is the assumption that you already have it. Okay? If I believe I know everything, if I believe I am the end all of wisdom, I mean, what then, pray tell, could you possibly tell me or teach me? You know, there's an old proverb that says, he that knows not, and knows not that he knows not, is a fool, get away from him. Okay, And that's what Paul is essentially saying here. A person that is walking around, that is filled with themselves, thinking they are the the end all uh, of all wisdom, is a person at the end of the day that doesn't really understand anything at all. All right. Finally tonight, let's close with verses 21 uh, to 23. So then, uh, let no one boast in men, For all things belong to you. I love this. He reminds us of that again at the end of verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Underline this. All things belong to you. Underline that. And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So Paul in these first chapters has has given us a couple reasons for division. Clearly pride is one of the reasons we have division. Another reason we have division, you got pride, and then another reason we have division is envy and jealousy. Now Paul's whole point here, his whole focus, is the thrust of what he's trying to get through to these guys and what he's trying to get through to you and I is, man, we need to get our attention on eternity. When I get my attention upon eternity, it takes care of my pride. I mean, there is a final exam coming, and when we wrap our heads and hearts around that, I don't have time. We don't have time to worry about how much better or smarter we are than somebody. I mean, I've got a judgment coming my way, man. I've got to cram for my own final exam. That's pride. And when I get my attention upon eternity, it also takes care of my jealousy and envy. I mean, what does it matter if the person sitting next to you has a, has a bigger house than you? I mean, big deal. What does it matter if you drive a 72 Buick and they've got an 04 Corvette? I mean, what does it matter at the end of the day? It matters nothing. Paul wants them, and Paul wants us to get our eyes upon eternity because a, a mind and a heart that are given over to eternity, are not, that heart is not going to be consumed with pettiness or pride, or envy, or strife. Now look at the end of verse 22. I mean, where is pride and envy and jealousy when Paul reminds me here at the end of verse 22, all things are mine. And that's what I want to close with. Again, underline that at the end of the verse 22 if you haven't. All things belong to you. You might have all are yours in your translation. It might say all are yours. It might say everything belongs to you. Underline whatever you got there. You see, dear friends, the day is coming when all things will be ours. If you want them. If you want them. 
Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? All of the universe, it belongs to the Lord. So it's all his. Now tune in. Paul told the Romans, Romans 8, 32, seeing that he has given us Christ, shall he not then freely give us all things? Right? I mean, seeing that he's given us the biggest, the greatest, the most awesome thing already, will he not give us therefore all things? He will. Only if you want it. It's like this. Imagine there was something that you really, really wanted. You've always dreamed of of having this thing. And and one day, I don't know, a rich uncle passes away, whatever. Let's say I come into all kinds of money and I don't know what to do with it. So I decide that I'm going to buy you that one thing that you so long after. So I go out and I buy it and I put it in a very nice package and and I get bows and ribbons and shiny, just beautiful package, and I give it to you, and you open it up, and you say, oh, I, how did you afford this? And I, this is what I've always wanted, and oh, you're just thrilled to death. Take the gift, but then you slide the box back my way, and you say, well, you know, the box is beautiful. It's very nice. Maybe you should hold on to that. I mean, go ahead, keep the gift box. My response is going to be, It cost me a great deal to give you the gift that was in the box. Why would I care about the box? If I have given you the biggest, the greatest, the most awesome thing, why would I not give you the packaging and the ribbons and the paper as well? In like manner, if God has gone to the trouble to manifest himself in the flesh, in the person of Jesus putting himself through unspeakable humiliation and torture and ultimately death by crucifixion, shall he not, now that we have become his blood-bought children, freely give us all things? Where's the pride and the envy and jealousy in that? Of course he will. (laughs) It's not what I'm telling you. It's what Romans 8.32 is telling you. Of course he will. But you got to want it. And they are yours for the taking. And God has furnished each one of us with time and resources and ability and gifts to build our eternal houses upon. Will you freely use what he has freely given? Will you love well the one that first loved you? Friends, you're saved. You're heaven bound. Most of you, I, I pray. If you haven't, if you have not bowed the knee to Christ, then come and see me and we'll fix that. All right? But most of you in this room, I pray you're saved and you're heaven bound. And you've answered the where question. By the way, there is no such thing as annihilationism. There is eternity whether you're in heaven or hell. Okay? The where question has already been answered if, if you've given your, your heart to Christ. If you've accepted his, his payment at the cross for your sin problem, the where question's answered. But now you've got another question. What is the quality of that eternity going to be like? And that is a function of what you have built your spiritual house upon, what you have done with that which God has given you. And when you consider the magnitude of, of your eternal existence compared with this speck of a dot called this life, it should cause us to rethink some of the decisions that we're making from day to day. You are on that foundation. God is telling you, take heed now how you build upon that. Because that will determine the posture of of, of your eternity forevermore. All right? Your eternity is marching towards you, friends. May each of us get our houses in order before we realize Decades of opportunity have passed that could have forever altered the landscape of our eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you've saved us. And Lord, we want to move forward. We want to move from the milk to the meat of your word. We want to will grow and develop 
And we want to, to take in this nourishment that, that you have prepared and provided for us. And so God, I pray this week that each of us would meditate deeply upon the eternity that is marching closer to us each day. That, God, we would make decisions in our lives with, with eternity in mind. That we would, as Paul said, keep our mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. Lord, we need your help to do that. We can do nothing apart from you. If it's even the desire for you, I pray that you would give us that, God. Deal with our hearts, correct us, encourage us. You have so much for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right.